Što? Imamo prezentacije, car put njih ili šta? Uh, ja imam jednu. Ovdje tu jedna. Ajde. Kaj? Možeš meni na moj, moj laptop. <laughs> Možeš na njegov laptop. Ej, trebamo mu imat ovaj nekakav. Čekaj samo. Samo prisloniš i... Hello, ministra. Hvala na nju. Mogu. Pano? Ne znam, nemam pojma. To je to. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesi njim poslao? Ja, ja, ja. Ja, ja, ja. Ja, ja, ja. Jedan test, jedan test, jedan test, jedan test, jedan test, jedan test. Kako idete po redu? Koji ste prvi, koji drugi? Pa ne znam kako ću ovoga, mislio sam... Da znam vas prediti, ja ne znam kako po imenima. Stavi je Einstein za prvo, onda će Melissa... Ne znam uopće nikom je ovo tu. Ovo tu je onda od Gabriele, ne znam kako. Ko je? Znači ovo imam dani ban, ne znam nijem čija je. Ne, to je od Reinharda. Aha, ban mi dao. A, ok, this is yours. So, I have it already. It's the first one, you will go first. But they will announce it, yeah, okay. And then Melissa, you will be second. So you're second, ok. I was thinking maybe... Okay, they're going to be like... Okay, okay. Okay, okay. No, no, no. No, 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 it's okay. Okay, okay. Okay, we will... Okay, so Melissa will go the last, fourth. Fourth, ok. Yeah, fourth, fourth. Okay. Just a second.
Test, test. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear uh, Davis participants, uh, it's a great pleasure to see you all here uh, in this large number and we know that it was uh, quite a long day so if you come to the Davis you can expand your life because in a week we can provide you several months of uh, this uh, working conditions in life. So. I know we started early in the morning, but uh, 
Let's try to keep it until the end of this day, uh, because tomorrow is another working day and then another, so we will have a lot of things to see. I hope you enjoyed the, uh, today's uh, lectures and also presentations in the parallel sessions. And now it's uh, time for our first uh, panel discussion. It's my great honor uh, and privilege to have uh, uh, colleagues here from uh, all around the world. So here right to me is Professor Reinhard Haas from uh, Vienna University of Technology. And uh, thank you very much for accepting the uh, invitation. Um, Professor Haas is uh, teaching uh, energy economics, uh, regulation and competition in energy markets, and uh, he's also working in energy modeling. And I will, must say that I always look to your publications, uh, Reinhard, and to publications of your students. You have some, kind of, let's say, advanced ideas, and uh, I hope uh, we will also follow uh, some of your uh, research uh, topics and uh, uh, so today we will discuss the energy com communities here. So uh, to the uh, right, uh, I have a colleague uh, coming from a far uh, uh, south, we call it uh, down under, so it's uh, Melissa Jackson, hopefully. Uh, it's three in the morning in Australia, so uh, let's hope uh, <laughs> Melissa will have uh, power to stay with us for these two uh, uh, Ours, but uh, Melissa is coming from uh, Griffith University from Gold Coast, Australia, and uh, she's uh, working uh, in uh, energy transition to zero carbon society, and uh, she also had uh, experience with the uh, smaller communities and uh, their role in uh, decarbonization. Then we have a colleague uh, coming from uh, Danish uh, Technical University, Dominic Franjo Dominkovic, who is coming from the prestige group of uh, Professor Henrik Madsen, and uh, he is working there on uh, development of smart energy systems, uh, models, etc. So uh, we will hope that we will see something of developments and uh, how we will be able to include this in the future development of energy communities. And then we also have a colleague from the Rome, Italy. Gabriele Umberto uh, Mangi from uh, uh, Sapienza University of Rome. Uh, and uh, we know, so next year we will have a conference uh, at your university, but uh, what is most important that uh, we can see that this development with renewable energy communities in Italy is uh, quite now uh, developed. So we are looking forward to hear what is going on there, but also around uh, Europe and the world. So uh, we will discuss uh, energy communities, which we heard today also from Professor uh, Gracia Carvalho, that uh, uh, are maybe the future of the energy system. So we need to make uh, and design our markets uh, suitable for the energy communities, because with energy communities, uh, uh, people will be able to produce, uh, consume, store energy, and maybe we will uh, have a more uh, democracy in uh, energy systems. And also with the new digital technology, blockchain and things like that, maybe it's not so easy to share electricity and uh, to have, uh, let's say, fair production and uh, storage and also uh, some kind of uh, good uh, uh, distribution of this uh, uh, capital in the in community. So, uh, uh, first, uh, each of the speakers will give like five minutes uh, introduction to the topic, to their main points, and then uh, I, uh, we will open the floor for discussion. So, any of your ideas, uh, any comments, any suggestions, any proposals are welcome. So we are here to discuss uh, this topic, which will be certainly uh, one of the uh, hottest issues, because uh, according to some uh, research and uh, studies that I read, uh, there will be like 45% of uh, electricity in 2050 will be produced in energy communities, which are not restricted by the, only by uh, 
the households or uh, residential buildings, we saw that they can be also the part of uh, with the industry, etc. So this is a quite wide concept, but maybe now it's good time to define it and uh, uh, go with the optimal one. So, but it will not be just a technical issue, which can be easily solved today with digitalization. It will be also the, let's say, uh, more social things or issue which needs to be tackled. Okay, so uh, Reinhardt, please uh, make first uh, pitch and then we will continue. Okay. Good evening. Thank you very much, Goran. It's really a great honor for me to be here today and to contribute to this nice panel event. If we discuss energy communities, Goran has already said what is the most important word, and this is fair conditions. In Austria, energy community is provided by a very simple approach. You just have to found an association and you have to find at least two participants for the joint production and utilization of energy. I will focus on Austria because we have already some experience. Actually, we are doing a project for the evaluation of these energy communities, but it's not so easy to manage the monitoring process in more than 150 energy communities. So I said an energy community has to consist of at least two participants, but we have energy communities up to 500 participants, and they are really companies and are also used by large banks, for example. So currently in Austria, we have more than 150 energy communities, and the major advantages for participating in such a community are, on the one hand, lower tariffs for use of the grid, and on the other hand, lower costs of electricity for the participants. This is a map, you can find it in the internet, and this map shows Austria and the number of energy communities in different regions. If you click on one of these dots in this map, you will get a list of energy communities and you will also get some contact persons, contacts via email, for example. So let's just look why energy communities became popular. And the first major reason is that we have reached grid parity, especially by means of photovoltaics. That is to say, as you see from the slide, in Germany, we have grid parity since about 2012. In Austria, we have it, I think, since about 2016. And this indicates to some extent that the PV system is also economically useful, despite <coughs> you do not have 100% on consumption. The first major challenge of the energy community is the same as for one customer regarding feeding electricity in the grid and taking electricity from the grid. And this challenge is to find a proper solution to distribute the costs for operating the network to all customers in a fair way, as Goran has said, and we have to justify the different approaches and distribute the benefits and costs equally. The second challenge is that we have differences summer versus winter. In Austria, we have a large majority of photovoltaic plants in these energy communities. We also have some small hydropower plants and a very low number of wind energy plants. So for example, for the small hydropower plants, the advantage was they were already depreciated. That is to say, 
there were no more capital costs. And this made it of interest for some operators to sell the electricity in an energy community, rather to sell it to the grid. So here you can see we have kind of a winter gap and we have kind of a summer peak, summer excess capacity. So the society, the system of power generators in a specific country has finally, in a top-down approach, com to complete the production and use by the energy communities. And I think this is finally the largest challenge. And number four here in this context is, think about last year. Last year we had an increase of electricity prices on the power exchanges, let's say by the factor 10. Today we have still around 100 euro per megawatt hour. And to some extent it might become more attractive for the energy communities or the generators in the energy community to sell the electricity to the grid because they get more money via the grid than if they sell it within the energy community. And this is an open issue which will be decided sometime in the future or it might change from year to year. Finally, I think what is most important is how can we ensure that the costs for the grid and backup generation are finally recovered in a fair and justified way. So I think it was less than five minutes and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Reinhard, and uh, thank you for providing us this uh, final question, which we will try to answer later. Now I will uh, like to invite uh, Dominic to give the second presentation. Okay, um, welcome everyone. Uh, as Godan said, my name is Dominic, and I actually have a double affiliation. I'm a senior researcher at the Technical University of Denmark, but we also have a spin off called AI Energy, where I'm a managing di uh, director together with, uh, with a few colleagues from DTU that used to work there before. And more recently, uh, we decided to try to commercialize some of the algorithms uh, that we do. Several topics that I will briefly mention now in, in a few slides. Uh, of course, there are many contributors from the group, like uh, Henrik Mess and Rune Juncker and several others that you can uh, see on the list, uh, because this will uh, be several condensed points of the whole group and not only uh, from my particular research. Points that I will make will also be somewhat uh, technical um, and uh, they will focus around energy communities um, as an actor that can provide flexibility uh, for future energy systems. First of the three showcases that I will show uh, is one of the papers uh, where we tested really many different scenarios. Actually, this is a representation of three dimensions, uh, but I should have represented four, but I didn't know how to do it. Uh, so basically, we just wanted to test really many different uh, scenarios of energy communities. And in the end, uh, we came to actually 180 different scenarios different combinations that were tested. You can see here three dimensions. Uh, so we can uh, focus, for example, on the y-axis, where we talk about three different strategies. One is economic optimization, so we uh, maximize uh, economic benefits for the community. 
The second one is where we also try to help the grid itself. And this is actually an important point of flexibility. Uh, so we, uh, we do so-called multi-objective optimization, looking for Pareto front, where we try to take into account economic benefits for the community, but also benefits uh, for the low voltage distribution grid. The third strategy was so-called self-sufficiency, when we just try uh, to maximize uh, consumption of uh, solar energy produced within the community, uh, not trying to arbitrage uh, according to the best possible prices on the markets. We used three different grid types, uh, actually from Germany. Uh, they represent city, suburban, and uh, village uh, low voltage distribution grids. And then uh, what you see on the upper axis, it's uh, five different um, configurations. This basically represents different type of customers, including households that have, for example, electric uh, heating, heat pumps, uh, heating, and uh, district heating. We also have different commercial providers. And the fourth axis that I could not represent is actually battery placement. So uh, you need, we need to multiply all these combinations and then multiply by three different battery placements, which was very close to the transformer station, somewhere in the middle of the low voltage grid and very far uh, from the transformer stations. Um, yeah, you can go uh, through the paper, uh, but the main insights were that, for example, by reducing uh, our economic benefits for very small amount, so less than 1%, we can actually significantly relieve the load on the distribution grid. So by reducing 1% of economic benefits, we managed to reduce the peak consumption for 50% in the, in the worst periods of the grid. What I also want to add uh, is that we used real load consumption from uh, Danish customers. So we had 300,000 uh, different profiles that we then clustered into, into typical, uh, typical uh, grid load. The second point is um, that battery location plays a really significant role. And this is where community can uh, benefit the whole energy system much more than having several smaller batteries in some very decentralized manner. So uh, putting battery close to the transformer station has significant impact. Uh, because of uh, voltage violations, uh, when we would have battery very far from the transformer station, could even reach 10% in different scenarios. And this is really on the borderline of what is acceptable. Um, I just also explained then the insight number three. The second point is something that uh, was started with the collaboration of our group and some of the annexes of International Energy Agency and it's so-called flexibility functions, which is sort of the, the maybe main point that I want to raise in this discussion today. Um, it was actually, it all started with this paper from 2018 from Yune, Rune Juncker, which is a colleague of mine. And after that, there are many papers that further refine this approach. But basically the main idea is that in a purely data-driven way, we can find optimal price signals so that the, either community or any consumers react in an optimal way from the grid perspective. So basically we are trying to find optimal prices so that uh, different consumers um, change their demand uh, based on, uh, on different criteria. We can have uh, the goal to minimize system costs, to minimize CO2 emissions or to maximize uh, self-sufficiency. This is highly a uh, non-linear problem, but we come uh, here to the uh, two other points. In this way, we have only one way communication, which is from technical perspective, much easier to implement. And then uh, a final point that is important towards this democratization of energy communities, by, by design itself, we protect the privacy of customers here because we have only this one-way communication and the central authority never knows exact reactions of these decentralized communities. So we are, the central authority only based on the data concludes sort of what is the reaction based on different uh, prices that are uh, issued to the system. And the final point in my five minutes 
is also one uh, tool that we uh, started, uh, that we sort of developed. This is then uh, offloaded in the startup that I previously mentioned. So we really believe that energy community should not be so complicated that we need plenty of consultants each time to uh, meet many times uh, with different energy customers, but we really think that we could automate it um, at least up to the point, and that's why we developed uh, this tool, solarplanner.eu. Currently, there are several countries that are implemented, like Denmark, Slovenia, next week, actually, Austria will be released. Uh, it basically, the main feature is that it automatically recognizes the rooftops. Uh, you can see, for example, in the lower right or upper right corner, uh, maybe the upper right corner is the best from the building that you see. It recognized uh, several different rooftop sites. You can see the rooftop model on the right also. And then it uh, gives you data such as rooftop areas, orientation, and slope in a fully automated way, so you don't need uh, really to, to do anything. In the user interface, it's uh, oriented towards individual customers, households, uh, so you can get the whole setup, um, including techno-economic parameters uh, for individual systems. But uh, what is probably more important for implementation sensors, energy communities, we also built a direct uh, API access, where then um, people can, um, can run the system for many dozens or hundreds of houses, maybe full uh, islands, all, all the houses that you have within uh, potential energy communities. And um, if you have ideas like uh, for, for collaboration, um, we can be rather quick in, in um, implementing a new country in Europe. So yeah, please uh, do contact us and hopefully we can uh, collaborate. Um, if you go to website, it's uh, free to use, so yeah, be free to, to test it out. So these were my uh, main points um, that were focused around flexibility provision uh, of communities, where I really think that being slightly larger size that individual households can really provide the needed benefits uh, in terms of the flexibility to the future energy systems. That was all. Thank you, Dominic. Now we are going to Gabriela. Maybe you want to show your case. And Okay, good evening everybody, and thanks for the presentation, Goran. As Goran already said, I am a PhD, PhD student at Sapienza University, and with this research, uh, with, with this team made by two departments from Sapienza University and uh, Eurac Research, uh, we try to approach the same topic uh, with a broad, I would say, broad and less technical perspective. We try to uh, review all the paper that has been wrote in the last three years uh, about renewable energy communities, trying to identify patterns between governance, economic, and, uh, and technical area that, that I can say that, that really cover the, the three main names of energy community. And the first thing we said is the boundaries, obviously, of the research. Uh, we said uh, geographical boundaries, that uh, it's European level, um, because uh, the time frame also that we said, it was the one uh, made by after the Renewable Energy Directive, so after 2018. The first thing that comes up to, my, to my mind, uh, looking at this map that was made by RESCOP, uh, is that uh, the speaker we have now, sitting here on the stage, uh, are from best practices, green areas. Uh, it's Italy, Austria, Denmark. Uh, they are the, the country that has RESCOP defined as best practices. Why? Because they have an actual definition of what is a renewable energy. Obviously, we have the European definition, but it's very broad, uh, and you don't really don't know what does it mean. But then some country started to define their own definition, and some 
also added enabling frameworks. So the first thing that we saw uh, in literature is that we have papers from countries that really have enabling frameworks. Are we always, obviously we are missing Australia, but, but we, <laughs> we found papers also from Australia, in particular on the economical side, and this is very interesting, and we will discuss a little bit about this later. But how we clusterize this, this research. We define three levels of, of analysis. The first, one, the first one is the organizational and societal factors. And we saw that in literature, when coming to uh, societal factors, uh, all uh, RECs are, are already always characterized by four main features. The first one is the goal of the energy community, what the energy community wants to achieve. Maybe 100% renewable energy or um, helping people in energy poverty issues and something like this. The second one is the initiator. It's a public-led approach top down it's a bottom up approach it's something in between and what we immediately see about those partners is that it may be if it's a public lead approach we will also have a certain kind of enabling technology and a business model we will see there the two other uh, level of analysis. The third thing that we see in the organizational factor is the legal status, obviously, and it comes from the initiator. If we have a public lead, probably we will have an association with the municipality on top uh, and something like that. If, if we have uh, uh, something in between, maybe with PM and uh, small medium enterprises, we can have a cooperative and patterns like this. Last but not least, we have barriers that define energy community. So wrapping up, and every energy community is defined by a goal, an initiator, and a legal status, obviously, and barriers they encountered during their way. The second level deals with enabling technologies, but Dominic will already say a lot of things about this, and enabling technology are not only energy production technology, but obviously also flexibility services, but we don't see any flexibility services in energy communities, for example, there are really uh, with a bottom-up approach because of lack of funding. So this is another partner that we always see in energy communities in literature. And then we have obviously a business model, a business model for benefit distribution in particular. Here, uh, research activity really gained from uh, um, cooperative games, shapely value, distribution, contribution, nucleus, core, everything that we saw in cooperative mathematical frameworks that can be easily adapted to renewable energy community, but still we don't have almost any real case scenario for benefit distribution because it's so young. So we have, at in, in Italy, we have really maybe two cases of energy community for which we already have a cash flow. We already have an income from incentives because we have an early transposition with incentives for energy community starting from 2019. So now we are seeing the first cash, cash flow for energy community and a, a real benefit distribution, but it's very easy because it's maybe some municipality lead approach and the benefit distribution, it's quite easy. It's not, it doesn't mean to be cooperative games on something else. So we choose this three level analysis because we really think that these three levels comprehensively represent the three main objectives of a new world energy community. And I want to hear from you if you agree with us. So the engagement and empowerment part of stakeholder, the obviously enabling technologies that you need to move the energy sector through the so-called 3D paradigm, decarbonization, decentralization, and digitalization. And last but not least, uh, a way to ensure the economic sustainability of those realities, so benefit distribution. So I already said some partner, I think the main conclusion is that uh, this heterogeneity uh, of at legislative level so that we have uh, different countries with totally different definition at a different stage really affect research on the topic. And research would really benefit if the rule of the game were set uh, equally at European or maybe at world level. I mean, like what is shared energy? We, if we set this definition equal, we can really develop optimization model while now we are just doing research for our own country, but it's not could be really applied when we are crossing borders. 
and how literature is lacking is lacking of real case studies, I think. It's, it's lacking of a real reliable data set from real case study. We have something, but still the, the, the aim of maybe of this work is to say next paper should really start from energy community that already exists and learn from them. That's where everything from my side. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Gabriella, for bringing these uh, topics out, and we will discuss them further. And I must say, I'm not so good in gender balance, so hopefully tomorrow we have a, a panel on uh, women in renewable uh, in, uh, energy research, but uh, hopefully Melissa accepted this invitation, and maybe she will also bring us some uh, insights, uh, not just on energy communities, as I said, but maybe we can also form the water communities, or as Gabriela uh, now mentioned, there is no maybe real sector coupling in these uh, communities, etc. So this is something that we can further think of. So Melissa, please take your point now. Thank you, Goran, and um, thank you very much for having me. It's a privilege to be here, coming all the way from Australia. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different tack today and um, share a few brief insights on the clean energy transition and bringing in that energy justice perspective from uh, the, the south, I guess the global south, but also from over the southern hemisphere. Um, and I'm going to highlight uh, some of the issues I'm bringing up just from a case study based in Vanuatu. Um, so I really just wanted to step back a little bit and think about where we're heading as a global community when we're talking about the clean energy transition. Uh, when we look at the SDGs, and this is from the July uh, report, um, we are not faring very well. We're on track for about 15% of the goals, um, about 48% uh, what does that say? moderately or severely off track, and 37% are um, stagnation or in regression. So it's not really painting a promising picture of, of how we're tracking for some of the bigger picture uh, areas that we're looking at. And what really comes out is that the poorest and, and most marginalised people um, are being impacted, that we're, they're unequally impacted by climate change, and they also have less capacity to participate in the energy transition. So when we're talking about leaving no one behind, I think we really have to keep um, that in the big picture when we're, we're thinking about how we design our energy systems and how they roll out. Um, for SDG 7, which is around uh, ensuring access to affordable and uh, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all, um, there is progress being made, um, but that, again, as I said, the world's poorest and most vulnerable are, are not really um, uh, up there on, on that progress. Um, at current pace, by 2030, there'll still be 660 million without access to electricity, and almost 2 billion people will still be um, using polluting fuels and technologies for cooking. And within that context, the international funding has also been declining in supporting developing countries, which is concerning. Uh, and so uh, within that as well, I guess, for the projects that are going ahead in, in remote and uh, isolated communities and developing countries, we're seeing that some of the benefits that are offered by um, the clean energy transition and energy communities are actually not being realised. And this is often due to this technocratic approach, um, often not actually involving communities from the ground up and lack of consideration of some of the socio-cultural aspects. Um, so just drawing on uh, this climate resilience um, redevelopment following a cyclone in Vanuatu, um, Vanuatu is one of the poorest and most vulnerable to climate change globally. Uh, a small population, about a quarter of a million people, and um, only 33% access to access to electricity. So there's, uh, as with many of the South Pacific and, and other um, uh, lower socioeconomic um, countries, there is a lot of support from, um, I guess, um, uh, civil society organisations, international NGOs to help those governments to implement uh, targets and there's a rural electrification plan for 100% um, by 2030, so quite a significant change from where they're at now. The project that we were monitoring was um, a small one up in the highlands in the cloud forests of one of the southern islands on, on Tanna. Uh, with um, philanthropic funding supporting a couple of Australian companies 
to build 14 cyclone-proof uh, shelters uh, and small-scale off-grid solar PV battery systems. Um, this was across three tribal communities and with multiple dialects and low literacy, uh, and the villagers had never had electricity access prior to this project. I guess um, part of our monitoring and evaluation I just wanted to touch on very quickly um, was that the installations were, uh, half of them were not operating after two years, uh, after one year after being installed, and four out of uh, 14 were working after two years, and I believe that after three years there was only one still functioning. Um, and often this was uh, some of the reasons that this was attributable. There was no maintenance or contract plan put in place. Um, there was no equipment available in the local area to be able to replace some of the issues, uh, some of the factors that needed replacing, uh, no battery testing equipment, uh, and all these things which seem fairly straightforward, but for a community that's never uh, had electricity before and didn't have the capacity building in place, um, it just meant that they sat there and, and weren't usable. And of course, the flow on effects to the community that were using them for things like economic development, like the women were um, doing weaving that they could then sell and make money from to um, pay for food and those sorts of things. Um, when they couldn't do that at night time because they didn't have lighting, then uh, that meant that they weren't able to produce as much as well. Um, there was also a big disconnect with this project and how, uh, how it worked in with the local, provincial and national governments as well. Um, so I guess just in terms of illustrating um, that that is a fairly typical way that many development projects um, operate in those communities, um, I'm doing a talk tomorrow about some of the um, Australian Aboriginal remote and isolated communities, which is quite a different context because of the governance arrangements, if you're interested in that. Um, but I think when we're talking about energy communities and, and the SDGs and uh, achieving, leaving no one behind, we really need to think that um, we're, they're at a completely different level. Some of these people have never had electricity, so we need to be telling them to, um, how, how to, use, sorry, I shouldn't say telling them, we should be enabling them to be able to um, access electricity and to work with them uh, to how, how they would like to see their energy future. Um, the idea of prosumers, again, is a bit of a first world sort of concept, so I think um, what does that mean to be able to get people to that state to begin with, and that's connecting in some of those foundational capacity building, uh, literacy, financial literacy, energy literacy aspects, and really, um, I think in terms of EU and OECD, there's a significant scope um, to increase funding to help support communities, that the funding criteria that are there also include whole of life cycle and whole of community approaches, that it's not just about dropping technologies in place, um, and working in partnership, so working with and not for um, delivering to communities. Um, I think there's opportunities to transfer a lot of the knowledge that sits in, uh, in uh, Australia, in uh, European, American countries, developing guidelines and principles, but that are um, done in conjunction with the, the governance agencies over there as well. Um, and also, uh, not time to talk about this today, but looking at that nexus between water, energy, food, uh, waste, uh, in, in that community scale, I think is got a lot of benefits in terms of both costs and social aspects as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Melissa, for bringing uh, these important issues of uh, achieving sustainable development goals, but also maybe uh, bringing up the issue of energy poverty and how we can maybe help with the energy communities to fairly distribute the energy and some resources. For example, in, in Croatia, uh, there are many of uh, households that uh, want to put uh, solar PVs on the roof and share the excess of electricity with uh, their neighbors that are maybe poor or don't have uh, so much uh, financial resources, but it's impossible, you know, they do not allow it. But then when you get a receipt, of your uh, electricity bill, it's written there that your electricity is subsidized by 70 euros per megawatt hour. And uh, I have a good salary, I'm a professor, I said, 
why you are subsidizing my electricity and you are not allowing someone to share this to the poor people, the electricity. You should subsidize electricity for poor people, not for the old people. So that's why maybe this is also one point in discussion, how we can uh, go to more fairly uh, energy system. Uh, so uh, now uh, let's uh, have a discussion. So here are panelists, but uh, it doesn't mean that you are not a part of the panel. So every, as I said this morning, uh, here we like uh, freedom and democracy. So any of you has the right to speak and uh, point out anything. Uh, so uh, let's uh, try to have some questions or comments or discussion on this topic and wrap it up. Okay, uh, who is uh, bringing the microphones to the audience? Uh, the people with the... Let's uh, give it to Ilya first, yeah. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm coming from Serbia. Uh, one of your presentation uh, was uh, left blank, was left white at your presentation. I am a researcher at uh, Institute of Technical Science uh, of Serbia, but I, I uh, did, uh, I'm a founder and I uh, inspired uh, uh, registration of the first energy community, uh, energy cooperative in, in Serbia, community, uh, called Solar Roofs in the city of Shabac. And uh, uh, it's very difficult in our countries to do that uh, without a, a whole uh, of support that uh, your countries have from European Union. We are, we are struggling uh, with the laws, with the implementation, with the, with the financing. Uh, we are uh, coming to such uh, conferences like this uh, to uh, sit together with you and to uh, participate in this discussion which must uh, be finished with uh, many, many colors uh, on the blank spaces that, that we saw. So uh, thank you for uh, organizing this, this panel and looking forward to learn from you. Okay, uh, it was a comment, I would say, and uh, thank you, Ilya, for uh, initiating this uh, energy cooperative, which is small spark can make a large fire. Okay, yes, please. Thank you, I agree with the colleague. Um, thank you for the panel and the presentations. I have two questions, like the main question, or the first one probably is for the males, kind of, because they were discussing something different, like it's more uh, energy communities who are interconnected to the grid. And the question is going into, do you think there is a possibility to apply market mechanisms to support energy communities? and what will be the advantages. So um, they were mentioning the flexibility and also the seasonal varieties. Uh, you were mentioning also the real that there is a lack of data sets, but do you think we are on that track soon or what will be missing? And the second question uh, for the doctor. Uh, I, I was very impressed about your presentation. I have to say, honestly speaking, I'm original from Panama, uh, but now I'm, I'm working in Germany. And we had something similar, but what caused my attention was that in the transfer of knowledge in the picture, you have a lot of males who were there for probably uh, seeing, learning, and, and whatever. In our experience in Panama, we have only women who are the ones who uh, take this knowledge transfer in the indigenous regions and they are in charge of the entire photovoltaic solar systems and they give maintenance to that. And there was a successful project because the women take charge of it instead of the guys. So I just wanted to, to share this with you and probably later in interchange some information about those projects too. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> thank you for this nice intervention. Maybe I will agree with you. So now I know what is the problem, why we don't have PVs in Croatia. There are not so many women in a distribution system operator in charge for the grids and everything. So I think this will need to change. But uh, maybe uh, some of you would like yeah. to answer the uh, question yeah, no, on market. I, yeah. I can answer the first question. Um, yes, uh, I can mostly speak maybe from the Danish perspective. Uh, this is already happening. There are, of course, also lots of barriers, so it's not everything as rosy, maybe, as, uh, as you mentioned uh, in Denmark. 
there are many sort of indirect obstacles uh, to having larger en energy communities. Um, the main problem is that energy community to go to the market needs to be rather big. Uh, more explicitly in Denmark, to go to secondary markets, uh, we need to have at least one megawatt of capacity, which is several hundreds houses uh, or maybe few commercial uh, sites joined together. Uh, but there are different tests, uh, there are different uh, projects, uh, especially now it's very popular with electric vehicle chargers providing different uh, frequency services, so I would say uh, it's coming. And especially uh, the potential that is a little bit further along the, the line, it's with low voltage grids, so with distribution. Right now there is some implementation on high voltage grids, uh, in the low voltage, it's really lots of problems that happened recently, and those were traditionally very conservative utilities, and they are suddenly faced with uh, incredible amount of decentralized sources. And uh, what they did in Denmark was just to increase prices like approximately 10 times. So for example, just to give you order of magnitude, in winter time from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., Danes will pay for distribution tariff only 300 euros per megawatt hour. And that can be three to four times your electricity price. Then you have uh, different tax, value added tax. So this was really like, how to call this, hammer approach, just to reduce the load as much as possible and not really uh, something proactive. But this is really where, where we see that lots of work will need to be done how to provide flexibility to, to this low voltage grid. And this is very, very badly researched. Um, it's almost non-existing flexibility at, uh, at this low level. So definitely a good point to work on. <coughs> that um, we depicted with the green areas like the perfect, uh, the perfection in the world, they are obviously they are not. Uh, in fact, if, if you visit the, the, the Rescop Tracker website, you can see that there, in the agenda there is another color, but it's not green, but it's the, the real best practices, but no, nobody already re reached that level because we are all struggling in some way. Also in Italy, uh, we are waiting, uh, and I think it's one year or more than one year that we are waiting for the final transposition of the Renewable Energy Directive. We still have this early transposition, but it limits renewable energy community a lot. For example, I am in the process of um, establishing uh, an energy community on an island, a, li a little island uh, in, in Lazio region, but still we are not able to do this because uh, we are limited to the secondary station and we are waiting then to allow us to do just one energy community in the whole island. And we are talking about uh, an island with 200 inhabitants and one kilometer long, but still we cannot do it a renewable energy community in the whole island altogether because we are waiting for the final transposition. It should arrive uh, at the beginning of October, but who knows? Six months ago, they said it's arriving. One year ago, they said it's arriving. So we are still waiting, but we are on the right track. That was the answer. We are on the track, but a little bit slow. I just like, would like to add two sentences on this issue of market. So I okay, it works. So there was a question, how can we introduce market forces? And actually, within the community, you have market rules and benefits. That is to say, the producer, the generator within the community gets more for his electricity if, than if he would fit it into the grid. And on the other side, the consumer pays less then he would pay for taking electricity from the grid. And in this case, I would even state that it contributes to energy poverty because people pay less for their electricity than if they would purchase it from the grid, including the usually high grid fee. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll just comment on your point about uh, gender. So thank you for raising that. Um, hopefully the photo wasn't too misleading because we went to great lengths to try and uh, set up the project so that we could do some of the capacity building so the women in the community could attend as well. 
Um, but that's one of the other things is often when you set up community consultations, uh, if it's a very gender bias structure already, um, it's the same people who, who go and attend and it's very much out of the realm of the women, women to be there. So um, in that sense, having multiple different times of day that you hold community events so that uh, it's not when the women are with the children or it's not when they're cooking or those sorts of things are really important. Um, but in terms of the success of those projects, it's very well established that uh, many development projects um, are working water as well. So uh, having that ownership um, by the women in the community, um, there's a, a lot of incentives there for them to make that work. And um, it would be great if we really focused a lot on the education and literacy of women, because we know that that brings communities out of poverty as well. So I think there's a big connection there um, between educating women in, in STEM uh, and just in the basics of, of energy as well that can um, really maybe lead to longer term sort of democratisation of the energy system. So thank you for that point. <coughs> thank you. Now, uh, Professor Carvalho wants yeah. to make a comment. I yeah. just want to make a comment on the transposition because the transposition is from the um, clean energy package of 2019. And the bad news is that now we are finalizing a new directive, so <laughs> they have to start again the transposition. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you had, uh, one of you had the table of the countries that have done the transposition. My, my country, Portugal, has done the transposition, but even with the transposition, there is a lot of barriers, continue to have a lot of barriers to the, the communities that want to, to have energy communities, energy sharing. So in this new directive that uh, you need to, tr to do the transposition again, we, we have done um, a group of uh, amendments, the text simplifying, so, um, um, the smaller players and the small energy communities do not go through a, a lot of requirements as it is now. Uh, also on the ta on the questions of the pay of levies and uh, uh, the, we also uh, uh, remove that. Uh, we have imposed that there is a one-stop shop for helping the communities. We are pushing the member states to be uh, faster and not to, to allow that they, there is uh, member states and communities that they do barriers for this to develop. So we hope that uh, we can help uh, a bit with this no new directive, but there is a lot of resistance. Uh, to, to the energy communities, even when the, the transposition um, is done. One thing we have not touched, and you have discussed this, because it's not our competence, it's local, com it's national and local, is the business model. And I think that is very important, that there is a business model, uh, who pays what in terms of the use of the grid that needs to be accepted and efficient for, for the development. So, and, uh, Let's hope that things go faster this time with the transposition. Okay, uh, thank you for this comment. It's it's really relevant for the for those coming from European Union, and uh, uh, let's hope uh, we will have uh, this transposition. But uh, maybe uh, this morning you pointed out that uh, Acer is formed, but it was like uh, forever. So in these two years, or let's say in 15 years, uh, doing uh, energy following it in Croatia, I think we have issue with the regulators, you know, so they are not doing their job, so they are not pushing the European policy to the level they should, you know, because they are, in at least in Croatia, they are more under influence of the government than on independent uh, source, so this is one of the questions, yes, or... Can I just comment okay. on the answer? On the, on the second part of the electricity market design that we have, the remit, we are giving much more uh, power to the ACER exactly because of that. Let's see, because we are negotiating with the council, if it will pass. Because the member states, there are member states with regulators work better than others and are more independent. And uh, they are not so happy that ACER has uh, more powers. We are giving much more power and uh, uh, staff and budget to research in order to, to avoid 
this situation that is not only in Croatia. There is a lot of uh, countries where the, the national regulators or because they are small institutions and too dependent on the state, they are not uh, acting as they should to, to, to push the, the European regulation. So let's hope. Okay, let's hope for the better and the better. Now you had a comment or question and then... Well, the gentleman there a little bit of both. <laughs> uh, I would really agree that uh, having local communities uh, exchanging energy is much better, and I've been already discussing a lot around the posters as well. Uh, I, I would like to look at this from the viewpoint of the people who live in those communities. Uh, in, in the current setup, and I have an overview of at least a few European countries, uh, for central grid, and local distribution companies, they form kind of monopolies. Even if they're not officially monopolies and uh, they're supposed to be neutral players, they're still monopolies physically and they sometimes abuse it. And you cannot even generate your own energy and just to use the local distribution company to carry it over to your property even at five, uh, five kilometers away. Uh, so in that case, uh, enabling local communities, uh, they need some neutral operators. But this is only the operator part. Uh, they also need some means, technical means, technology means, to first generate their own energy, and second, to store it because of the variations. This would give them sufficient power bargaining power with the central grid so that they cannot be extorted. They will be less energy dependent. So within that context is the question, uh, what kinds of energy storage, both for heat and power, or any of these, what kinds of heat or power storage you would consider appropriate for community level energy storage. Okay. Uh, can we answer this or <laughs> we need to? Um, I, I can, uh, okay. Sorry. Um, I can uh, yeah, answer at least, uh, at least partly. I agree, as, and one point was sort of um, one advantage of having at least slightly larger area or uh, more consumption than a single house is that it's more probable that uh, there is, econo from economic uh, standpoint, a feasible investment in storage. And this uh, then uh, opens uh, much more possibilities. Like the simplest, especially if someone is, uh, of course, looking into providing uh, grid services is just to install uh, a battery uh, or lithium uh, battery, which is probably also one of the most expensive uh, ways of doing things. In terms of thermal storage, what we, uh, what we saw so far, uh, this concept of micro district heating maybe didn't really uh, gain much ground. Um, and it seems that if district heating is in play, that more centralized uh, storage um, is, is predominant. And here, uh, more specifically, from, from Danish perspective, it's uh, pit thermal energy storage that is the, the most present. For others, it's uh, basically really like a huge pit, uh, maybe with 200,000 cubic meters. There are uh, examples. It's enormous, like dozens of football fields. It's uh, basically just some thin folium that is laid down, filled with water, uh, that is then heated uh, maybe to, to 90 degrees. And then this can uh, be something even um, uh, acting as a seasonal storage uh, from, from summer to winter. Okay, uh, Professor Duic is not here, so he will answer that every apartment needs uh, four cubic meters yeah. of water of storage. So yeah. there is a point to have community storage of hot water and not uh, in every household. But about this, uh, the storage thing, we have a lot of papers in literature on storage, energy community and storage. Most of them, they talk about batteries. 
uh, some of them also thermal storage, but there are really few literature about sector coupling techniques and energy community. There are some studies about vehicle to grid applied uh, in places of work, uh, because if you have photovoltaic, you cannot make the best of vehicle to grid at in your home because you're charging mostly in the night. So there are some articles, only theoretical ones, no real case study, but there are things about sector coupling, but really I think literature would benefit by uh, all other demand side management and sector coupling techniques not that are in some way connected to storage, but are different kind, in a different kind of way. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Andreas Nathanidis from Concordia University in Montreal, Canada. Um, uh, at Concordia, we just got a big grant from the federal government, 123 million for seven years wow. on decarbonized and resilient communities, and I'm the scientific chair of the project. It's a university grant, and it, and it deals with this topic of resilient and decarbonized communities with emphasis on electrification. But just to give you an example of how complex Canada is, uh, we have three big energy lobbies. One is the oil lobby, which is in the west of Canada in Alberta. Another one is the nuclear lobby, which makes <laughs> small nuclear reactors. And in Quebec, we, we, are, we are located, we have Hydro-Quebec, which is state-owned and 99% hydro. So it's a very different situation in different provinces of Canada. And uh, so uh, uh, one of the topics we are dealing with in this big grant is design of sort of energy communities. Not only uh, using existing communities, but designing them, okay? Designing the buildings, designing the energy system in the buildings, the decentralized system, and decentralized system, and so on, different options. So uh, what I want to ask in Europe, are you looking also at desi the design of such communities, including the buildings and everything from the beginning, or only retrofitting existing uh, communities? So that's my first question. And the second question it deals with policy, you know? Uh, the relationship between the different levels of government, you know, municipal, provincial, federal in most countries, that's a very difficult issue, you know, and very often it's the main obstacle, you know, in implementing this. We have one community uh, which is all electric with EVs in London, Ontario, in Canada, with my colleague here, Caroline Hashem. Uh, we are studying that community as a case study. It, it includes EVs, a micro utility business model, and we participated right from the beginning in the design of that community. So everything about form, solar form, optimization of the buildings, avoiding self-shading, avoiding shading, and uh, looking at, so it's a very complex problem when you are dealing with new communities because the design of a new development takes five to 10 years. So, the, uh, so my first question has to deal with this design aspect. And that includes design of new communities. The other one is heavy retrofit, you know, where you retrofit the buildings, put the energy systems, EVs, and everything. And then the second, the political question, dealing with the different lobbies, the energy lobbies in the different countries or even provinces, which is a situation that you have to deal with because it's there. I, I mean, one question I got from somebody when I got this big grant are you going to be doing research on small or uh, modular nuclear reactors? I told him, no. <laughs> not because I don't like nuclear, but it was not part of the proposal, you know? But, but you know, all these questions come up. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. let's try to answer them. Uh, first of all, maybe the small nu nuclear reactors are the uh, future of energy communities, but uh, let's not <laughs> think in that way. And uh, the second thing is that uh, I think you are safe in Canada because you don't have a natural gas lobby, which is the worst oh, one. Ah, oh, then you have a... Um, um, <laughs> An oil and gas lobby there. Ah, okay, they are working together, okay. <laughs> so it's even worse, yeah. But uh, for, I would like to congratulate you on your project and looking forward to see the results of it. And now let's try to answer the questions on design of energy communities and on the lobbying and uh, so you can <laughs> okay. try to... Maybe first a question. You said all the existing communities when you... What do you mean with all the existing communities? 
Of what? Well, uh, you know, to create an energy community, to create an energy community, yeah. you can use an existing uh, neighborhood or city, but you can also do a new development. Let's say for 200 houses and design it to be an energy community right from the beginning with integrated electric vehicles and everything. Centralized storage, distributed storage, seasonal storage, everything. Yes. But so I that will be the most ambitious thing, to do something right from the beginning. Yeah. But as I said, there are different sizes of energy communities with different features. And it is important to state that such an energy community as it is currently promoted in Europe is a bottom-up approach. So that is to say, people can join together in a democratic way. They can start with two or three and we have energy communities of up to 500 participants. Yes. And if we have the 500 participants, then it's a real project. And then you will really calculate how can we make the optimal solution, for example, regarding including different types of storage and including electric vehicles. And Canada and Austria, for example, have in common that we have a lot of pumped hydro storage. Yes. And then the energy community must not have its own storage, but it can use via the grid also this pumped hydro storage. So then it's really an energy system optimization, as we have already also heard from the colleague, I think, from Denmark. Yeah. So my opinion, most important bottom-up approach, there are as less rules as possible and gives freedom to the people, but ensure that you have, from society's point of view, the correct distribution of the costs of the still existing network. But, but okay. just, uh, just a fair law. But it can be a bottom-up approach even in the development of a new community where you are starting from scratch to build a whole new neighborhood, let's say, with 100 houses, uh, based on a cooperative uh, uh, approach, you know? Like the kibbutz in Israel, for example. You know, I visited Israel. <laughs> they, they, they are doing that uh, yes, in so our case. This is uh, for a question of a geographical scope, etc. But uh, maybe there are examples in Europe where we will build the. Uh, uh, so, Gabriele, you, 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 you make this uh, <laughs> scanning of this research, so maybe you can no, point I think out. It's very, yeah. No, there, there are no, 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 there are nothing like this, I think, in Europe, because, uh, I mean, for doing something like this, you need years, obviously, no? And to do it, I think you need, if you want to do an energy community and not a positive energy district, so that, that's something just connected with energy, but if you want to do an energy community, you need, uh, and you want to design it from, the, from scratch, uh, you need a co-creation phase with the community, and this is something that takes a lot of time. But it would be very interesting. I want to be there if you do it, please. <laughs> and just to, to, to answer, <laughs> to answer the, 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 second, uh, the second question about uh, how do you deal with different uh, uh, region, municipality level, regional level, I just want to say that um, a strange thing that is happening in Italy is that uh, all region, a lot of regions, are now financing feasibility study. So it's something in some way also feasibility study for energy communities, obviously. So it's some way also connected with the de designing part of the community. But they are doing this in different ways depending on the on the region. Some regions are financing directly the municipality. So they are financing, a, let's say, a top-down approach where there is the municipality creating the energy community. Others are financing citizen association of people. So with different amount of money, obviously. And um, so it, 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 just this, this kind of political level is, is starting to create a totally different realities all around the same country, Italy. And that I think it's interesting to analyze. Okay. Uh, yeah, congratulations on your project. That, that's very exciting. Um, I just wanted to kind of reflect on the transformative governance approach, which you talked about co-design and, and um, cooperative processes. And I think it's really important when we're designing things that um, we think about the future uh, aspects, the, the uncertainties, the risks that climate change is going to pose as well. And so building in that 
um, scope to, to not lock in or lock out particular technologies. Uh, and I think that co-design process with, you're talking about the different levels of government as well, uh, we've been working on a, a resilient communities project with um, local, state and, and federal government agencies in a region where I live in Australia. Uh, and bringing in all those different perspectives. So the, the technical, um, the, the different priorities of governments and the communities as well. Um, if you don't have the community because it's not yet in existence because <laughs> you're built designing for it, um, then bringing in the types of people who might be going to live there in the future and, and asking their perspectives. So that dialogue process I think is really important and thinking about that long-term visioning and, the, and where that community wants to be at the end of that and how the energy will serve that purpose. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of literature coming out now about how we um, plan for these kind of uncertain futures and, and transformational change in terms of climate action. So I think there's lots of potential there in your project to really um, embed and test those co-design processes in a really innovative and amazing way. So that's exciting. We like this co-design world. It's, uh Okay, yeah, you I would also, also just like to add a short comment. Um, I think that at least partially, and maybe even Gordon is better here, we have these uh, directives, at least inside the European Union, like net zero energy buildings. So let's say new, new projects by automation have some sort of, uh, of at least very small energy communities, um, as they should not emit uh, at a net level CO2 emissions. Uh, but I also want to add that there are some projects that are maybe more like a commercial than, uh, than really on a big scale. There are some projects in Denmark with even uh, smaller houses that are built as energy communities. But then this process is not really democratic uh, because then you can decide to buy <laughs> under these rules or not, uh, or not to buy. It's uh, not really that there is this uh, collaboration uh, along the way. Okay, thank you. We will not discuss the lobbying because this is a never-ending story, but uh, I can tell you that you have two options. You can make a new lobby for energy communities and renewables, <laughs> or you can uh, make the, the lobbies from uh, fossil fuel, uh, nuclear and hydro to look for the possibilities to new business models and to switch to renewables and to make profit in this sector or energy efficiency. But so we, were, we had three questions. Uh, gentlemen, uh, would you like to know? Or then uh, Professor Kilkish, uh, please. Did you want to ask the question? Yeah. Ah, okay, so they were first, uh, Professor, then. <laughs> uh, thank you, I'm Alvaro. I'm coming from the Polytechnic University of Valencia. Thank you for, for, the, uh, for the opportunity. Um, I was actually t uh, thinking about the, these big projects like solar projects in Spain. We have big uh, like power plants and they have a very huge impact in the region and the population in the area on the visual effect and the also, I don't know, you all do hiking, you will uh, face it. And one solution for that um, or one approach to make it more fair for the popular, uh, for the local population, maybe to socialize part of it and build an energy community at least, I don't know which percentage, but from a part of it and make all the people involved in this project and make it probably more accepted. Uh, I don't know, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Thank you. Uh, totally agree with you. There is a quite nice example from Denmark when they put this offshore wind power plant in the front of the Copenhagen, which is, you know, a million uh, uh, citizen city. So the, what they were making this part, so they offered the part of the uh, shares to the local population. And this is, I think, definitely way how to go. Maybe you want yeah. to comment? Uh, or something. Uh, just in Australia, we had a very um, big community reaction to some of the wind uh, wind farms in the local communities as well um, and the most successful ones were the when they had um, community dialogues to talk about what the issues were, talked through it and provided uh, opportunities to participate and take ownership uh, and eventually it, it took a long time for some of them but to break down some of those barriers but 
uh, again, it's not um, confrontation and, and uh, you're right and we're wrong. It was about talking about what the issues were. We live here in place, so coming up with those place-based solutions um, and I think that's, that's definitely a way to kind of um, do conflict resolution as well in these situations. Yeah, isn't in, in this little island where I'm following this energy community, uh, we are trying to make a confrontation with the municipality about uh, where to put PV panels. Obviously, we have er any kind of restriction uh, that you can imagine. So we, we are trying to do the feasibility study together. Obviously, I'm doing this like it's a dream. We are trying to do it. It's not easy at all. But uh, yet, if you put the community in the decision process at the beginning, uh, even if you're doing something that at the beginning wasn't in their mind, then uh, if they are in the process, they accept it in some way. It's co-design, yeah. <laughs> co-design, yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, now, Professor Kukus, uh, you had a question or comment. Thank you, Goran. Uh, I would like to first thank to uh, the speaker about uh, Archimedes whom we have been working in Ashray for more than 20 years, who brought the issue of new uh, communities. And I would like to express my feelings that I totally agree because new communities bring uh, little constraints, but more diverse opportunities, like designing from the root, the buildings, and uh, their solar systems, new terminal units with low enthalpy for heating and cooling, optimizing their land use and etc., which may not be possible for existing communities. Of course, I am not singling out our efforts for existing communities, but I would like to uh, recommend that we should also focus strongly on new community designs. Thank you. Yeah, as, uh we can, I uh, think, all agree with your uh, comment that you. if you are designing whole new community, think about uh, how they will share uh, energy and, uh, let's say, have a district cooling, district heating, or all the benefits that can be come from the shared uh, facilities. Uh, this is quite difficult. Sometimes in Croatia, even in a new household, when you have several apartments, people don't like to have now common... Uh, source of heating and cooling because everyone wants to have uh, their own privacy and bill, etc. So uh, f it's not just a thinking of it. I think we can also need to make regulation that will force us to think differently or uh, use resources wisely. Just, just one comment on that point. In Australia, we've got a major housing crisis going on and so there's a lot of money being thrown at the construction industry to put up housing very quickly uh, and in and new areas. And I think there's a, uh, a lot of highlighting of the issues around sustainability being built into planning regulations and so on because they're just prioritising getting these up at low cost. So um, a good opportunity in the design of new, new areas to actually reflect on what is underlying in your planning and, and design processes and make sure that they're really considering those big picture um, priorities. So. Okay, uh, the, maybe we can agree also that this uh, big issue in developing countries which need to also, you know, provide uh, new house, households and they are, have really growth of population. Uh, gentleman in the white shirt, uh, no, no, in the, not in the pink, but he, the white shirt was before, you know, and so. Hello and everyone. Then, uh, yes, you, you raised the yes, hand yes, before, yes. yeah, okay. Thanks for the, for, the, for the discussion today. Uh, my question is related to the bottom-up approach, especially for existing communities. I was wondering, what's your perspective about virtual communities? So the possibility to connect based on the same feeder rather than have like a connected infrastructure. Thank you. Did you say a virtual co or a connection? Okay, so virtual, virtual, virtual like uh, this is something that very, very short. In Italy, we just have virtual community. It's the it's mainly it's the only option. You, you're you're connected to the national grid, and then you exchange your energy in a virtual way. So you produce, you have prosumers that obviously sell from some part of the energy, but then all the energy shared 
is virtually shared between the community. You don't have new cable. I don't know if that was what were you saying. Dedicated pricing structure, because then you have net metering that is quite different, because you have like a two tier between selling electricity and purchasing. So I was wondering if by virtual community, it may also be easier to overcome all the limitation linked to the creation of dedicated price structure. Because at the end of the day, like the dynamic price structure is just a translation on the world building stock. So that was my question. Thank you. Yeah, at, at the moment in, uh, in Italy, we have uh, energy, uh, the incentive that is exactly on the energy shared, so in, on an hourly value. Each hour, the energy produced by the community and consumed in the same hour by any member of the community is incentivized with a given feed-in premium tariff. This is how we are doing now in Italy, in a virtual way. So we have the, uh, in the market, is just showing this hourly, uh, time step and seeing how much you produce and how much the community consume in the same hour and then incentivize looking at these factors. And I think it's, it's quite easy like this, yeah. Maybe just one additional comment. I think at least all over Europe we have a broad range of different designs of, let's say, some energy communities. We have citizen communities in some countries, and these are to some extent based on this virtual aspect. Then we have this renewable energy communities, as I mentioned, in Austria, and they are rather based on physical boundary conditions. And I also know that Portugal has been a pilot pioneer in this dimension of the energy communities, maybe somebody knows more about it, but they also, again, have a different approach. So if you speak about energy communities, it's not a very clear definition, but you have in detail to look it up. And I think we have seen a table on different countries, and in these different countries, some have taken the definition of zero European Commission, and uh, six, seven, eight have made their own definitions. So there is some caveat regarding a general assessment and saying that one size fits all. Okay. Uh, yes, please. Please introduce yourself because... Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm David Panaschak from Montana University of Leoben in Austria. So I'm not doing any research on energy communities, but I have heard that we have it. And so far I know that we have this legal framework that you can set up the community, but I'm not sure how far we are developed in Austria or anywhere in Europe or anywhere in the world about some tools that enable flexibility to the, um, to the people that are in these uh, communities so that they know when there is production, maybe the solar planner can help them to integrate it in such a some community tool that they see when energy is produced and when other people actually use it already so that not there is an overshoot of consumption suddenly because they all expect uh, we have uh, PV production, but they should also know what is the current level of consumption. Uh, do we have tools to allow people making such, de such decisions and also maybe to give them some easy tool to estimate would the storage make sense in their uh, grid not somewhere? to estimate storage uh, capacities for their area. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, we know that we have aggregators that can help uh, energy communities and uh, consumers to aggregate their uh, consumption, production, etc. So, and they have uh, different tools, but maybe uh, Dominic or Gabriel, you want to comment on these tools because maybe you're more aware of it than Yeah, um, I think at least, uh, what I know mostly from Denmark that uh, there is not like a generic tool that is widely uh, used for energy communities and it's still more like consultancy based approach that is done uh, community by community. Of course there are many general forecasting tools and forecasting PV production at least is rather well known problem. Of course uh, forecasting load, uh, especially if it's small community is much much uh, trickier field. So I don't think uh, there is one size fits it all. 
but also with what I mentioned, for example, with solar planner, um, it's something that we uh, are trying to do at least in the design phase. So not in operational every day, but in the design phase to see based on the consumption uh, available rooftop area production, like what could be the optimal uh, battery size. And yes, in Italy we also have uh, gam gamification application, I would say. So uh, some application that you can also download on your cell phone. They are connected to smart meters in all houses of the uh, members of community. And they show you weather forecasting. So tomorrow there is the sun. We expect this production from PB. You should uh, do the washing machine at one o'clock. And now there are somebody else doing this production, this consumption. So you should move your consumption this hour. So today there are these tools connected to smart meters. But obviously you need money for this. You need money for installation of smart meters. Uh, those. Um, that are mm, using uh, like giving this uh, uh, software to communities uh, often ask uh, a percentage of the community income. So let's say nobody's using this now because there is a problem of lack of funding to initiate a project. Uh, there is a problem of too low incentives for energy community. Imagine if I can also invest on those kind of uh, appliances. It's not easy, but they exist. Okay. <coughs> gentlemen at the end and then uh, gentlemen for uh, this now. Thank you for very interesting discussion. I'm Dmitry Bogdanov, LUT University, Finland. And I have a very general question. What's your opinion about number of people, share of consumers who would be actually prone to join these energy communities and actively participate in these communities? In reality, because we are here interested in renewables. For us, it would be fun to participate uh, in these discussions, talk, find out the best uh, optimal structure. But for a general person who's not interested in renewables, who, who's full of problems in life, then additional problems, fights with greed, uh, monopolies, continuous discussions about new storage, maybe continuous discussions with neighbors who, who are not ready for any compromise. So for that people, it can be too much right now. And uh, just removing the obstacles uh, for communities, maybe not enough because uh, we need also to advertise the people for people the possible benefits because for a general person, the benefits of participation in this community can be not that clear, so. Okay, thank you. Michael, okay, Dominic. Um, I think it's a super good question. And actually recently we had one uh, incredibly talented master student, Paula, who did her thesis on, uh, on an energy, real energy community in Spain, or that was just being initiated. So I think uh, that you're right, that uh, at least here at this conference, we probably live in, in a bubble of people that are very interested uh, in maybe some social environmental aspects. But what was uh, from, from uh, Paula's social aspect of the thesis, it was qu quite clear, like slightly more than 90% of the people, the main interest for joining community was to get cheaper electricity. So let's say like if we have one uh, very simple indicator like uh, like price, I guess people would join just by having uh, cheaper energy in the end, like if, if it is uh, possible. So I think um, to really spread communities um, to some significant le level, uh, lots of automation will need, uh, need to be there to reduce the, the price of uh, starting investment. And in the end, uh, I think at least that it will come down uh, to the price um, as an indicator. Uh, another key element for uh, citizen engagement uh, in energy community, I think it could be to uh, establish communities of services that can be able to erogate different services to people, to members of the community, not just uh, a price uh, tariff and tariff for a little amount of money at the end of the year. Yes, this is something that you can, but something more. Something like uh, with this money, we can offer you, for example, 
mobility services, electrical mobility services, so we can create a market for food uh, that is uh, zero kilometer and you can access because you are the member of the community with a lower price and in some way you are engaging people in a community, always giving them money but in an indirect way and in a more maybe interesting way also. I think if we just keep telling the people that they have to do this because we have to move the energy sector in this way, if people are not coming to the West Conference because they're not interested in renewable energy, maybe they're not joining an energy community ever, but if we, are, if we find the contact with them in some way, it could be mobility, it could be food, it could be water, we can find a nexus with them and create a real community with people. I think this could be a key issue. Um, I'll just reflect on a project we've been doing in uh, the Northern Rivers area of New South Wales, which has um, just had some of the most extreme floods they've ever had and bushfires in 2019 as well, which has been a real driver for resilience building. Um, what we wanted to know was, um, are people interested in participating in greenhouse gas reductions activities, energy saving, but also building their resilience as well? Um, so we conducted a, a baseline survey of that community uh, and it showed, as, as the others were talking to, um, cost is, is a driver, but it's only one of many. Um, building social ties, um, um, strengthening community, um, looking after future generations, they were all drivers for people as well to participate in these activities. So I think um, uh, that project and that data is now helping guide the local government and the state and regional governments uh, on their adaptation planning, on their um, climate planning and on their energy planning as well. Um, so I think we probably need a lot more research on this place space, actually asking communities what, what they want, where they sit. We've got a lot of, um, in our community, kind of climate deniers who uh, respond to different messaging uh, than other people who are on board with the whole um, green and sustainability. So understanding where the community is at, I think, is a real foundation to be able to make evidence-based decision and, and planning as well. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, no, the gentleman be behind yours, he was the... Huh? Good evening. My name is Giovanni De Libra. I'm working in Savianza University of Rome. We have been uh, working for uh, more than one year now about uh, helping the regional government of Lazio, that is the region in which Rome is placed, uh, to build uh, the first uh, seeds of uh, renewable energy communities uh, in the area of Lazio, of course. Uh, I can share you with you some ideas. The Italian law on incentives uh, basically has been designed to help communities grow, but to avoid them oversizing their power plants. Um, the mechanism of incentives do not uh, basically discourage you to do that. And uh, the reason for doing that is the fact that uh, the distributor want uh, communities not to impact on the high voltage uh, grid, the transmission grid especially. So, uh, technically, there is this part. From uh, um, a perspective, we are following, uh, at a certain point, we reached something like more than 90 communities. Right now, there are some uh, regional laws to help people develop uh, and uh, giving incentives for uh, feasibility studies. Uh, there are 50 communities left. Uh, the major issue that uh, we found are the fact that the legislation is still not fixed and uh, not being able to uh, providing a, a realistic financial plan because uh, final incentive scheme has never been approved. It's struck somewhere uh, uh, since uh, almost one year. Uh, it is difficult to, uh, let's say, helping people building the first communities. Uh, especially because uh, at the beginning they do not understand that they should not overproduce electricity around. And also there are no laws about, uh, let's say, heat, for example, uh, air conditioning. And a lot of other facts are basically working against that. For example, you cannot mix incentive for electric mobility with incentive for renewable energies. So it is difficult to build a project that uh, 
uh, exploit both kinds of incentives because then you have the double incentives and uh, you cannot really, uh, let's say, separate them from uh, uh, a technical point of view. Uh, also, there are uh, other legal issues that uh, up to the point uh, are not really helping communities to grow. Uh, as for technologies involved, uh, the 50 communities we are working with uh, are all based on PV panels, uh, maybe some batteries somewhere. There is uh, just one that uh, exploits small wind turbines because it's one of the few that uh, basically uh, has access to that kind of technology. But, uh, and another one that is exploiting uh, uh, biomass fueled uh, cogeneration because uh, it's in a mountain community. Uh, so you can see there are a lot of problems from uh, a legislative point of view and also from uh, citizen being involved because of uh, lack of definitive incentives and also because it's difficult to explain to them how a renewable community works. We have made lots of uh, assembly with people. They were curious, uh, but uh, it is difficult for them to understand exactly how a renewable energy community work. And in that case, uh, it is difficult to involve them. You will have uh, two, three, five people that are really keen on that, uh, that then will drive with the other ones, uh, but then uh, everything is a struggle. So we are positive that uh, the process has been started uh, and uh, that it will lead to, let's say, some, uh, the first seeds of that. But it's uh, a really long process. Uh, especially to start uh, uh, winning the first inertia of people, uh, of profession, uh, professional engineers or uh, even architects that are involved because uh, there is a lack of understanding also from prof uh, professional people. Uh, we're leading also, let's say, helping them with developing tools to sides uh, properly the communities. But uh, uh, I think there is still a lot of work to do in this sense. Okay, thank you for this uh, really nice uh, intervention from the field and uh, let's hope that you will manage to get more people on the board and it will go faster, especially now when we will have these new directives and uh, amendments, at least in Europe, so uh, thank you. Uh, I ju no? just want to underline this fact because we are all from university, but we didn't say this uh, until now, this educational part. Edu education on renewable energy community. What is a renewable energy community? We have to we, we have to do courses in university, in high school, uh, in squares, uh, everywhere to say people what is an energy community because it's not it's not easy to understand. It's not easy at all. Like, but if yes. we don't start from education, it will never. I agree, and uh, education starts in kindergarten, so we should yeah. go <laughs> there instead. Okay, gentlemen uh, here, and then uh, Shir and. Uh, Yes, thank you very much for this discussion. I'm Francesco Cruz, I'm from uh, Polytechnic in Milano, Italy. Um, so I'm interested in this topic because this year, my group and I, together with the Luxembourg Institute of Science, we finished a project and published the results about um, designing an energy community in Luxembourg, which uh, would be based on a, it's a peculiar integration of photovoltaic panels uh, and green roofs, vegetated roofs. So photovoltaic panels installed on top of uh, vegetated roofs instead of bare roofs. So the idea, we focus mainly on cost effectiveness of this new uh, energy community and we saw that if we take into account all the costs and benefits, tangible and intangible ones, then it would be cost effective. Nevertheless, if we take into account, if, if we take into account the, the perspective of only the owners of the, of the buildings, then things would change. So we, we basically ran a probabilistic cost-benefit analysis. We saw that uh, it was cost-effective in 60% of the cases. So this brings uh, me to the question. So uh, according to the European regulation, the last one, the Re Renewable Energy Directive, the second one, uh, the recast, um, renewable energy communities are entitled to support schemes, incentives perhaps, and enabling frameworks to, to in incentivize their spread. Now, would you think that renewable energy communities in Europe and in general over the world would need uh, and, and should, should require um, monetary incentives by the governments in order to, to, yeah, in order to basically develop across the, across the countries? Or would you rather say that they would need to be cost-effective 
themselves without any support from the government because there's a um, there's a possibility uh, that is granted also by the European re legislation for citizen energy communities, not renewable energy communities, not to be incentivized anyhow. However, it is allowed for them, the citizen energy communities, unlike renewable energy communities, to, um, to make their, all of their activities, their primary commercial activities, their primary professional activities, which it cannot be done for renewable energy communities. So, the question is this, uh, do you think the, the government should provide these incentives or not for, uh, in order to, to, um, to allow the, the spread of these communities? And would you think that the, the fact that uh, members and shareholders of renewable energy communities cannot make it become uh, their primary commercial activities hindering their development? Uh, very quick from my side, just one second. Uh, I really believe in uh, community energy um, with com community of services you, you've mentioned. So they are able to sustain economically by themselves. When we are talking about the Italy incentives, they are granted for 20 years, not more than this. So I also believe that what is now missing is the startup funding, startup investment, something to initiate the project. Then uh, if you give them something to initiate even for just uh, one year, for 10 years, five years, something to start, maybe then they can grow by themselves. But I really believe that in the sort of phase you need the government, in the government incentive. I think actually the government should not intervene too much in the energy community and they should also reduce the subsidies, but you have there are two different aspects. One aspect is the construction of a new plant and there might be subsidies for constructing a new plant, but this is regardless whether this plant belongs to an energy community or not. Okay. Um, yeah, from my perspective, I think at least that to really spread it out uh, on a large scale, that it should work without uh, incentives. I mean, in energy systems, it shouldn't happen that everything needs to be subsidized in order to work. To, to say explicit example from Denmark, there are no incentives. There's uh, absolutely zero incentives to, to start an energy community, although there are indirect incentives because you can apply from some scientific projects where something is case study, so let's say some consultants are working there more or less for free from the perspective of that um, energy community. I think the better example or better way to go would be to remove generic subsidies. For example, this is very common, at least in Southern Europe. Uh, when bad times come, governments just make a generic subsidy for electricity price for everyone, no matter whether you are rich or poor, big company, super inefficient company or efficient company. And then this actually artificial lowering of price is already removing some incentive to, to make something better. And then we counteract this with additional subsidies mm -hmm. for energy communities. So in this, uh, in this uh, play of like cat and the mice, we, we actually end up subsidizing uh, everything. So I really think that, uh, that the way to go should be to remove subsidies, at least uh, completely to remove it for fossil fuels and even to, to generic electricity consumption and then to start from that point, uh, from that point on. Okay, thank you, Dominic. Now uh, we have the last question from the Shear, and then we will make the uh, conclusions for all discussion. Thank you very much for this excellent uh, panel. Having a wide range of perspectives from all regions, uh, including uh, Europe, uh, Latin America, North America, and Asia Pacific. Uh, to have all regions represented, I may add one case, again, coming from Steves community from Africa. Uh, this is where a PV uh, based system was given from uh, Mabita, uh, Kenya, including uh, solar energy for charging also electric bikes, uh, floatable electric lanterns to help uh, local fishermen and also to increase uh, clean uh, drinking water access and supporting other uh, energy demands to help uh, SDGs uh, also there. Um, we were in a session uh, at end of July in Nairobi and international session and there you could also see coming to uh, small island developing, developing states that they're very motivated to uh, address climate change and also to integrate both mitigation and adaptation. Uh, renewable energy is part of a big part of the solution because they also are able to um, uh, 
address their reliance on uh, fossil fuels and to sh uh, show that an alternative future is possible, but it's also where you have a lot of needs, capacity building needs. Melissa, in her presentation, you mentioned uh, the importance of working in partnerships with the local communities. I want to ask also, Melissa, uh, are you aware of any uh, aspects where small island developing states, they are working in partnership with each other to help energy communities in uh, diverse um, islands, uh, small developing island states, uh, sits around the world. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, and I think that's a really good point. The partnership is not just, say, north to south and development agencies, but it's uh, across communities who are learning from each other. I think that's really important. In terms of examples, um, off the top of my head, and it might be because it feels like four o'clock in the morning to me <laughs> that I've forgotten, um, but that it's, uh, there's uh, the Pacific, um, I'm trying to think of the, the name of it, but there's a, an organisation, um, SPREP, the South Pacific Regional Environment Program and others that have been working together across countries to build capacity and often they do it um, as a region uh, generally and they'll come together because I guess that uh, um, scaling up of their resources and, and learning from others um, has always been kind of a partnership approach and in fact a lot of uh, island communities have that sort of reciprocal sharing approach that they use together. So um, I'm happy to talk to you afterwards offline about some examples but I think there are quite a few out there where they're actually adopting a partnership approach. Um, in terms of energy communities I think um, maybe they call them different things, but the, the drivers are there around um, bringing, bringing themselves out of poverty, having control over the systems, uh, and being able to have the skills and capacities to manage and operate those systems themselves. And as I said from the case study, not being reliant on external expertise and external technical contractors and, and external funds to, to have control of their community. So, yeah, happy to chat more after this session. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, <coughs> Professor Karaskhalilovic, would you like to comment on something? Okay. <laughs> and then uh, let's conclude uh, this session. So let's start from Gabriel there oh, and uh, we will finish. Conclusion. Oh, thank you, Goran. Thank you for all the speaker and every everybody that add something to this panel. And just one thing I want to I wanna say to everybody, if you really want to uh, understand the difficulties of energy community, try to join one if you have someone around you or try to establish one if you don't. Because this is the only way to really understand which are the difficulties. And uh, I'm lucky because in my neighborhood in Rome where I live, they are establishing one. So one week ago, I signed the, the Constitution Act of the Energy Community of my neighborhood. But and then and then you see the people trying to do this thing and all the difficulties they're encountering. So my hope is that you can find your one or trying to establish one because we need it. If you're here because you you believe that this it could be a way to change the energy market. This is a really nice uh, message. It's way to go and try to involve kindergarten in your uh, energy yeah. community. <laughs> okay, Dominic. Yeah, uh, thank you also uh, everyone for joining. I mean, we started 11 hours ago. So I guess it's good that you are still uh, awake and uh, having so many questions. My main point would be, uh, I guess we are mostly here researchers, especially if you are in your PhD working with energy communities, look into low voltage distribution grids, um, how, how communities can help this grid. I think it's very under-researched uh, under area and then maybe it's uh, some low hanging fruits to publish some paper and then <laughs> graduate uh, in, in a peaceful manner. Um, thank you for having me and um, I've learnt a lot and I'm going to be learning a lot more about the situation in Europe at the moment. Um, I guess I would probably reinforce the value of working in transdisciplinary environments and having these rich discussions between people with technical expertise, engineering, um, social sciences, uh, communities, government, um, because we really are facing the biggest challenge um, and we need to do it together and learn from each other. So I think the democratisation and the social justice elements of energy communities are really promising for the future. There's a lot of technical and uh, regulatory issues to sort out, but I think we can only do that together. So 
Thank you. Thank you. Some years ago, I recognized that more and more people became interested in their own, especially electricity supply, purchased PV system, purchased storage. In the last years, I recognized that these people more and more joined. They joined in energy communities because they recognized that they, it doesn't make sense to do it on their own and have the single project. And for the future, I think there might be even a different model. So I think the energy communities may have limits, but maybe we will find other solutions which bring about the same benefits as there are. We have a bottom-up, a democratic bottom-up approach, and it is obviously said it is good for the environment We reduce the CO2 emissions. So I'm right now optimistic that we will find better and better ways in future to cope with our problems and to increase our benefits. Okay, uh, thank you, Reinhard. Uh, we heard uh, all our panelists. Uh, thank you really. Thank you really much. Thank you very much for this uh, kind of uh, contribution. I would like to thank all the panel, panel, all of you for interventions, for comments, for questions. Uh, we hope it was interesting. And uh, uh, for the end of the day, uh, I would just say that uh, Melissa showed us that we are on 50% of sustainable development goals, which means that we need now to speed it up, uh, put it in the uh, gear that is really fast and because we have just uh, six years uh, <laughs> to, to reach it, uh, so to be above 50% or more, which will say that it, we are successful. So energy communities are coming, uh, which need uh, the laws, regulations and uh, everything that will make them feasible. Let's make it bottom up, top down, horizontal and uh, let's make them. Thank you all and enjoy the evening and see you tomorrow.